is going on, guys? JD from New York here, and this is WWE Off The Script. This is number 37, part number 3, to close out what I hope was a great weekend for you guys. Thank you so much for watching me, wherever you may be, on this beautiful Sunday morning. This is week ending, November 2nd, 2014. I got a loaded show for you guys today. You're not going to want to miss this one if you guys are interested in knowing what I got lined up. Let me run through my cheat sheets for you very quickly. Dean Ambrose vs. Bray Wyatt announced for the Survivor Series. I will give my full opinion on that match being announced this weekend. TNA likely to remain with Spike TV. I got the latest news and rumors regarding T, uh, TNA and Spike TV negotiations. I got news on Rusev. Finally. Finally. Challenging for the United States title. Vince. I've been telling you this for fucking months now. Now you finally listen to me. Great job, bro. Great job. I'll talk about that and what happened on SmackDown this past Friday in what should be a great feud for the United States title. Kurt Angle likely to remain with TNA. I'll give you uh, everything regarding Kurt Angle and the latest news on him. Brock Lesnar may be challenging for the WWE Championship at TLC against John Cena and what WWE might have in mind. I also got news on Cesaro being punished. Yes, like a sixth grader, he's being punished because he spoke up against John Cena, or spoke out, I should say, against the immortal, the godlike John Cena in a recent interview, which now has landed him in the fucking biggest doghouse in the WWE. I know that might anger some of you, but I got full details on that. You're not going to want to miss this one. And I got more news on Randy Orton and certain things going on with Randy Orton. So this is going to be a loaded show, guys, all right? But if you missed off the script this weekend, parts one and two, links are down below. I know YouTube has kind of fucked me over the last couple of weeks with off the script. I don't know what's going on, man. I don't know. I wish I could tell you. But a lot of you have come to me and, tell, and told me, JD, where the fuck is off the script? I don't see it in my sub box. So that's why I always do these plugs in the beginning of my programs, man. It is in the description down below, all right? You guys can go check that out. In part two, I talked about WWE being in financial ruin. According to the New York Post, one of the New York City's biggest news publications, newspapers, uh, they are talking about WWE on the verge of collapsing due to the network and them not meeting then their quota of 1 million subscribers. Interesting read, interesting article. Go and check that out if you did indeed miss part two. In part one... The former WWE Divas Champion, Eve Torres, may be making a return to the WWE. A lot of Divas news in the last couple of weeks. First, there was Mickey James rumored to be making a uh, WWE comeback uh, and lobbying for a comeback on Twitter. Now, it is Eve Torres. I would love to have both of them back. They would certainly add a nice dynamic to the Divas division. So, if you guys missed anything regarding Off the Script this weekend, Parts 1 and 2 will be linked down below in the description of this video. Go and check them out after part three if you did miss those episodes. Number two, chair shot reality at WrestleZone.com. I never go a video without mentioning these guys because I love them dearly. All right. Labar, Eisenberg, and Ghoulish, go and check them out. Spreading the reality of the wrestling business. And they are also the number one talk show on the internet when it comes to professional wrestling. WrestleZone.com, ChairShot Reality, uh, Reality. their homepage will be linked down below in the description of this video as well. They also have a YouTube page. Everything you see on ChairShot that uh, is not uploaded to WrestleZone.com will be uploaded to their YouTube page as exclusive content. So make sure you also go subscribe to ChairShot Reality's YouTube page. That is also linked down below in the description. Show those guys some love. Tell them that me, JD from NY, sent you over there, and they greatly appreciate all the support, all right? And finally, Joe Cronin Show. If you guys want additional wrestling content here on YouTube.com, besides Off the Script and what I do here, Joe Cronin Show is your man. Link to his YouTube and his Twitter will be linked down below. Go and check him out. He's got all sorts of shit going on over there, and he's also got a second channel, Spectrum Gaming 617, I believe it is, where he does weekly Monday Night Raw reviews and pay-per-view reviews every month. So go check him out. Link to his Twitter and his YouTube down below in the description, all right? Now, let's get into the news and rumors for Part 3. WWE confirmed on their Facebook page Friday night that Dean Ambrose will be facing Bray Wyatt at the WWE Survivor Series 
on November 23rd. The message states, just announced, the lunatic fringe, Dean Ambrose, will go one-on-one -on -one with the deranged Bray Wyatt at Survivor Series, live from the Scott Trade Center in St. Louis, Missouri, on Sunday, November 23rd. While the match has yet to be announced on WWE.com, the Scott Trade Center's website has indeed confirmed this match. Wyatt interfered in Ambrose's Hell in a Cell uh, match against Seth Rollins um, on October 26th, costing him the victory. The only other match confirmed for the show is a traditional Survivor Series elimination tag match, pitting John Cena's team against the Authority. Now, my opinion on this, I think it's too soon for these guys to be stepping in the ring one-on-one. -on -one. The way the WWE used to do it back in the day. Okay, I'm going to use the 1993 Survivor Series as an example. You got the All-Americans against the Foreign Fanatics, all right? You got the Undertaker. Listen to me. You got the Undertaker, who's got the dead man gimmick. He's fucking ice cold, man. Nothing phases this guy. He's got the dead man gimmick going on. It's one of the hottest things in WWE at that time, leading into the Royal Rumble 1994, where he went one-on-one -on -one against Yokozuna in a casket match, and then The Undertaker did not resurface until that SummerSlam where he fought himself at SummerSlam, which was a god-awful main event, by the way. Just uh, bringing back terrible memories regarding that feud. But what I'm trying to say is, and I know some of you guys came to me and told me, J.D. Bray Wyatt is a loner. Bray Wyatt is a cult leader. He's, uh, you know, he's all about being uh, a solo guy, and he doesn't belong on a Survivor Series team. Well, neither did the Undertaker. Can you imagine the Undertaker reaching for a hot tag against Lex Luger, or, or uh, on the t on the same team as Lex Luger? That's what happened at Survivor Series. The Undertaker, the Steiner brothers, and Lex Luger were a fucking Survivor Series team, man. Which one of those four guys do not fit in the equation? It would be the Undertaker. But yet, he was on the All-American team, man. And from there, they built The Undertaker versus Yokozuna in that match. I want you guys, since you got the network for free now, all right, I want you guys to go watch The All-Americans versus The Foreign Fanatics at the 1993 Survivor Series. It is the main event. And when Lex Luger makes that hot tag to The Undertaker, it always sends chills up my spine, man, to see The Undertaker finally... Tagged into that match, goes one-on-one -on -one against Yokozuna, who's 560 fucking pounds. He's scared shitless as a WWE champion. The Undertaker beats the shit out of him, flying clothesline, choke slam, uh, and it's just the crowd going crazy. Bobby Heenan being fucking his hilarious self as usual on the microphone, all right? And then The Undertaker takes a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, sits up. Takes a bonsai drop, he sits up. He takes a fucking shot to the face on steel steps, and he fucking raises up. And they built the feud from there. So, what I'm trying to tell you in short is, I would like Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt on the opposite ends of a Survivor Series team. Then, leading into the next pay-per-view, you could always put them at TLC one-on-one. -on -one. Why is it WWE... Always rushing to get a few going, to get these two in the ring. Isn't it better if these guys kind of milk it out? Why do you immediately have to put them in a match? We can still see them get their, their hands on each other, but why do you have to always rush directly into a match and rush into a feud? You know, the slow build is completely forgotten now in WWE. Everybody wants things like this. I want to fucking sit back and watch a feud develop. That's why I brought up the Undertaker-Yokozuna thing, because that led to a casket match, and that casket match was fucking great, because I really didn't even think about uh, that ending happening. Mr. Fuji pulled a fucking fast one on us, man. Sends out his goons. You had fucking Diesel, Bam Bam Bigelow, fucking Head Shrinkers coming down, Jeff Jarrett coming down there. Uh, you had uh, a bunch of his Japanese guys come down there. Crush was down there. You know, they beat the shit out of The Undertaker. 12 to 15 guys buried The Undertaker, and he lost that match when we all thought he was going to be the WWE Champion. All right? I didn't have access to the internet back then, but, you know, I watched it, and I was shocked when I seen that ending. But what I'm trying to tell you is Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt should be, should be on the opposite end of a Survivor Series team, and then they can build to a one-on-one -on -one match. They don't necessarily have to be going one-on-one -on -one at Survivor Series in a rush job, okay, that's what I would have liked to see, but apparently WWE has other plans, and they're booking Dean Ambrose versus Bray Wyatt, do I think this feud is going to be great, yeah, 
Okay, they need to kind of build on why Bray Wyatt attacked Dean Ambrose. They have to build more so than what they said on Monday night. Do I think these two will be phenomenal in the ring, one-on-one -on -one against each other? Yes, I think it's going to be great. Now, it's up to WWE to get the explanation across as to why Bray Wyatt attacked Dean Ambrose. That remains to be seen. News on TNA. There has been a great uncertainty regarding TNA's future because of its television deal with Spike TV, the current home of Impact Wrestling. In July, word got out that Spike would be pulling the plug on Impact Wrestling uh, upon the expiration of its deal with TNA. The deal was originally slated to expire at the end of October, but the two sides would agree to extend the deal through the end of 2014. That's where we currently sit. Now, the most recent word regarding TNA's quest to find new television deals uh, states that John Gubrick, okay, a TNA executive, was in New York City at some point in late October to close the television deal. In, in the previous reports that were floating around on the Internet, the identity of this company was not yet known. PW Insider Now has published an update on the situation in which the website noted that TNA's Impact Wrestling will likely remain on the air with Spike TV past 2014. Within TNA, there is a strong feeling that the two sides have agreed to a deal in which TNA will have to take less money to remain with Spike TV. A source from Spike confirmed to the website that the two sides have remained in discussions regarding a new deal. On the other hand, those in TNA informed the website that the two sides have never cut off discussions and re-signing with Spike was always a strong possibility. This is great news for Spike TV, great news for TNA Impact Wrestling, and it's great news for the wrestling industry as a whole. People get to keep their jobs, hopefully the guys backstage, the wrestlers that go out there and bust their asses every night, get to keep their jobs, get to continue making a paycheck, and it's great for the wrestling industry, man. It sucks, and this is why the WWE is in its current state, man. There's no competition to WWE. There's no alternate, uh, you know, outlet for professional wrestling here in the United States. It's either WWE or TNA, and, uh, you know, those people want variety. WWE is failing because there's no competition. So this is great news for Impact Wrestling. Not saying that TNA is going to be competition for WWE. That's, that should be the last thing on their mind. They should be doing what is best for their company, getting their uh, company respected week in and week out. That's what they should be doing. And that, sh that should have been their focus from the very beginning. They might not have been in this current situation if they just followed that ideal. Okay? So that is good news for TNA. Uh, during the October 28th tapings for the uh, October 31st Halloween special of SmackDown, Rusev officially makes a challenge to Sheamus and his United States title. As previously reported several fucking times by yours truly, okay, a program between Sheamus and Rusev for the United States Championship is expected for both men. On October 28th, Rusev had a match with the great Khali, he and Lana also cut promos in regards to Sheamus and the gold that he carries around his waist. The claimed, uh, or he claimed that, uh, or Lana, I should say, Lana claimed that the Bulgarian brute is coming after the United States Championship and that he will capture it. Sheamus has threatened Rusev before in interviews, which further hinted that a feud between the two was on the horizon. With Rusev already positioned as a dominant uh, WWE superstar against most of the locker room uh, of American descent, the company now are putting him against someone of another nationality. The way this program works, however, is due to the United States Championship. Rusev challenging for and ultimately winning the United States title will allow he and Lana to become an even bigger anti-American foe. Okay, If Rusev holds the United States Championship, he can brag for months about how he captured the title, how he can brag about being so dominant and strong, comparing his attributes to those of Russia's and claiming that both he and the country are so much greater than the United States. Really, Vince? I've been saying this all along. Pay me. Moving on. All right? I don't have anything to say about that. I've been fucking expressing that same fucking ideal for months, man. Nothing new here. If you've been watching me, you know I've been saying it. All right? I'm not lying here. Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle is believed to have signed a part-time deal with TNA. This makes me sad, folks. This makes me very sad. He belongs in the WWE. He belongs in the Hall of Fame. He belongs at WrestleMania against Rusev, all right, for that United States title. 
but Kurt Angle's deal will allow him to wrestle and pursue acting at the same time. The story of Kurt's signing actually broke on the Wrestling Observer website and has been expected that he would be staying with TNA. Stories about WWE offering him a full-time deal are inaccurate. WWE would never offer someone with Kurt's history of injuries a full-time deal as a performer, especially at his age. Dixie Carter will make an announcement at some point, possibly when they announce their new TV deal. There were talks between Angle and WWE, but WWE showed no interest in bringing back uh, Kurt Angle. As noted before, Vince McMahon was very leery of bringing him back because he was afraid of something happening to him on their watch. Very bad move, Vince. Very bad fucking move. I would have broke out the fucking checkbook and gave Angle whatever he wanted. Someone like Angle can only make your stale product better, okay? That's it. That's all I will say about that. I've expressed my feelings on Kurt Angle. I think he and Rusev would have a fucking fantastic match, and he would be the ideal opponent for Rusev going into WrestleMania. Instead, we may be stuck with John Cena versus Rusev at WrestleMania 31, and who the fuck wants to see that go down at WrestleMania? I don't. I would have loved to see Kurt Angle at WrestleMania do what he has to do and be the Olympic gold medalist against Rusev. That would have been money. That would have been money. But apparently Vince McMahon is more worried about Kurt Angle dying on his watch when he said in multiple interviews, especially on the Ross Report with Jim Ross, that he is 100%. He is rehabilitating. He's getting back to full strength. He is sober. He's a family man. He watches the, the, the WWE product every week. It would be money. And I don't understand why he did not go after someone like Kurt Angle. Hopefully he he will be back at some point. But he is signing a one-time deal, part-time, one year, for TNA and Dixie Carter once again. Brock Lesnar may defend his WWE title against John Cena at TLC in December. As previously reported, Cena recently became the number one contender for Lesnar's world title uh, by defeating Randy Orton at Hell in a Cell on October 26th, where Cena vs. Lesnar... For the title was originally expected and advertised to take place at the Royal Rumble in January, which I previously reported here on Off the Script. The advertisements have since been changed, and the bout may take place in December instead. The number one contendership for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship was decided inside of a Hell in a Cell, but the stipulation merely stated that the superstar that won that match, Cena, would have a future shot at Lesnar and the WWE title. The event where this future match will take place, was not promoted. This is due to the lack of WWE's assurance as to when they will be scheduling the match. Lesnar is currently only advertised to appear on WWE programming just once more before the end of 2014. And uh, that is during uh, a Monday Night Raw, which will take place on December 8th in Greensville, South Carolina. The TLC Go Home Show edition, as well as the 2014 Slammy Awards, okay? The advertisement claims Cena will be competing in the annual Royal Rumble match. So there's an advertisement going around that claims Cena will be in the Royal Rumble match and not fighting Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship. As always, the winner of the over-the-top rope elimination battle royal will earn a spot uh, at WrestleMania in the main event and be granted a WWE World Heavyweight Championship. You guys know the deal with Royal Rumble. Cena has won two Royal Rumble matches before and will be vying for his third victory in the annual battle royal come January. This is according to the advertisements, okay? I do not speak like that, okay? That's just reading. Uh, I'm reading from the advertisement. This would likely mean that Cena vs. Lesnar will take place at TLC, and that Lesnar's appearance on the December 8th edition of Monday Night Raw could be more than just a Slammy Award acceptance. With the Raw episode being the last one before TLC, it would mean, or it could mean, Lesnar is scheduled to be there to finish up uh, and build towards his third match with Cena this year. Regardless of when the match is held, Lesnar is expected to be victorious and continue pushing towards WrestleMania 31 as the WWE champion, all right, then where does Brock sit at the Royal Rumble? Who does he face at the Royal Rumble? Brock Lesnar and the Royal Rumble are kind of hand in hand, man. You can't have a Royal Rumble without the WWE Championship being on the line, all right? And I know everybody watches the Rumble for the Rumble, but the Royal Rumble is a big enough event where you have to showcase uh, Brock Lesnar. I think so. The Rock did it with CM Punk, and uh, the WWE Championship has always been defended at the Royal Rumble. Right? You got the championship, you got the rumble, you have an idea of who's going to be in the main event at WrestleMania. That is the beginning of the road to WrestleMania. So I would hope Lesnar is at the, the Royal Rumble event to defend, but if he's not defending against Cena, who does he defend against? I don't know, 
this report seems a little bit odd to me, but uh, I do think that they are going to hold off uh, and have Cena versus Lesnar at the Royal Rumble instead of TLC. But that remains to be seen. We'll find out more as uh, the weeks go on, okay? Now, I got news on uh, Randy Orton. Conversely, all right, around the time Randy Orton was on Twitter making his opinion known about WWE's stance on his merchandise, Orton was upset that WWE did not release any new merchandise for the Viper, especially a potential RKO out of nowhere shirt. I would buy that. I think I would buy that. RKO out of nowhere, motherfucker. I would definitely buy that. Orton would even go on to take shots at WWE for having a plethora of John Cena merchandise. Meltzer wrote that Orton did not get punished because he is bulletproof. Okay? This is going to lead into my Cesaro story. All right? I want you to know, Orton spoke out against John Cena. And he did not get punished because he is bulletproof. Imagine that. Imagine that. The political garbage in WWE runs high. All right? Moving on. Additionally, he noted that WWE may be waiting to add such merchandise for Orton because he's not a full-fledged face just yet. Typically, the merchandise of a heel does not sell that well for WWE. I like buying the heel stuff. I don't know about everybody else, but I like the heel stuff better than the face uh, superstar. Uh, with Orton becoming more and more of a tweener who will likely turn on Seth Rollins and the authority, new merchandise for Orton is on the way. Moving on to making a point that Orton is bulletproof. Cesaro did the same thing. Spoke out against John Cena. All right, listen to this story. I'm going to end this uh, off the script with this story. Within the latest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, there is an interesting tidbit about WWE superstar Cesaro, who seemingly can't cross the threshold into stardom for the company. Okay? At the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view on October 26th, Cesaro lost a two out of three falls match to Intercontinental Champion Dolph Ziggler. While fans were split on Cesaro winning the match, what really made things intriguing was that the fact Cesaro could not score one pinfall on Ziggler. Okay? The majority of two out of three falls matches in WWE always go to the third fall. The next night on Monday Night Raw, Cesaro was seemingly squashed by Dean Ambrose, who Cesaro was slated to face in a match. The bout between the two would not occur because Ambrose beat Cesaro with a microphone, chasing him up the ramp prior to the bell ringing. However, during the upcoming October 31st showing of SmackDown, the two will meet again. Based on what transpired on Sunday and Monday, you can guess how Cesaro fared in that bout. Cesaro's most recent losing streak has some fans wondering if the King of Swing did anything to anger those in power within the WWE. Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter has an idea on what may have caused such a losing streak to occur for Cesaro. Looking back at an interview Cesaro did prior to Hell in a Cell with a United Kingdom-based website, below is what Cesaro is possibly being punished for, and I quote, this is what Cesaro said. It's a new era of guys. It's a new generation. And it's a lot of fun to watch that. Because there are fresh matchups. I mean, I'm sick of seeing John Cena against Randy Orton for the 500th time. It's great that we have some new young guys that can come out and provide absolutely great matchups. And for the fans that are fresh, exciting, and fun to watch. I don't see what he said so bad. I don't see what he said so bad, but apparently he spoke out against John Cena and Randy Orton. For the 500th time, and him being sick of it, all right? This is a shame. Political garbage in WWE. You got to keep your mouth shut. This is why everyone is afraid to speak up, because if you speak up, you're pretty much buried on WWE TV. But then again, this is Cesaro's fault. He's a seasoned veteran. He should know the ways of the game. Why would he do that? I have no fucking idea. But when Cesaro wakes up in the morning and he realizes why he's on a fucking massive losing streak on Monday Night Raw, on SmackDown, on pay-per-view. When he wakes up in the morning at a hotel room, wherever he's fucking, you know, sleeping, wherever, whatever city he's in. And he wakes up, he looks himself in the mirror. And he wants to know why he's on a, such, he, on, his, on, on a bad losing streak. He's going to look himself in the mirror and be like, you know what, man, it's my fault. It's my fault. He spoke out against the Golden Boys, John Cena and Randy Orton. You can't do that, man. You can't do that. So Cesaro getting punished for speaking up against John Cena versus Randy Orton. Let me know what you guys think about that one. 
political fucking garbage in WWE where no one can speak their mind. But like I said, Cesaro is a seasoned veteran. He should have been more aware that if he said anything, he was going to get punished. Look at Ziggler. Look at Ziggler. He was in the doghouse forever, right? He was in the doghouse for quite some fucking time after what he said about Randy Orton during a few SummerSlams ago. Right, he was in the doghouse. Now, finally, it looks like he's out, and he's the IC champion, and he's on a nice little winning streak. He's being paired with Team Cena at Survivor Series, potentially. So, you know, Cesaro may be in that doghouse for a very, very, very long time. But let me know what you guys think about Cesaro speaking up against John Cena versus Randy Orton. I know I would have said the same thing. I'm feeling the same thing. But you can't really say it and give WWE a bad name like that. You can't speak up and give John Cena a bad name and Randy Orton a bad name. You know, when you're doing publicity for WWE, you got to be fucking cut and dry, man. You got to be fucking, you know, very, very neutral. You can't say anything too bad. Cesaro went off script and said, I'm sick of this shit 500 fucking times. I want to see new matchup, fresh faces. We got the talent to do so. What the fuck is going on? But that's what I got for off the script, guys. Let me know what you guys think about everything I talked about on this episode. Great episode. Thank you guys so much for watching me. I will be back, hopefully... If I'm not too busy playing Advanced Warfare with a Monday Night Raw review on Tuesday, I am off on Tuesday, so look forward to that potentially. If I don't have one, you know why. And if you want to catch my Advanced Warfare Call of Duty stream all day, Monday and Tuesday, link to my Twitch is down below. You missed any previous videos for WWE content, link is down below. Share Shot Reality, link down below. Joe Cronin Show, link down below. Make sure you check all that shit out. If you want to buy my brother's music, link is down below as well. This is JD. Thank you guys so much for watching Off the Script number 37. We'll be back as always with the number one source for WWE news and rumors right here on YouTube.com. Next week, Friday, Off the Script number 38. I'll see you guys there. Until then, take care, and I'll talk to you all very soon.